sir. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the exhibition sponsors. The presenting sponsor is the Atticus Trust in memory of Betty Brown. We also gratefully acknowledge the Metro Nashville Arts Commission, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts for their ongoing support. It is a complicated honor to be invited to have a museum exhibition because it's also an invitation to work relentlessly for several years. We are delighted by this collaboration, the quality of the work, the exhibition design, graphic identity, interpretive materials, and the exhibition catalog. The catalog, which was published by Vanderbilt University Press, is available in our shop. On behalf of everyone at the Frist Center and Vanderbilt Press, I want to thank Jack for being a gracious, generous, and professional colleague. Jack Spencer is a resident of Nashville whose photographs have been exhibited and collected internationally. He gained recognition in 1996 when his work was included in The South by Its Photographers, an exhibition organized by the Birmingham Museum of Art. Spencer's work was exhibited with his peers, Shelby Lee Adams, William Christenberry, Melissa Springer, and others. In addition to this landmark exhibition, his work has been included in group exhibitions in museums in the United States and abroad, including the Corcoran Gallery, Washington, D.C., Hunter Museum of American Art in Chattanooga, the Mars Museum of Art in Augusta, Georgia, the Museum of Modern Art, Frankfurt, Germany, and the Museum of Photographic Arts, San Diego. Spencer has had over 100 solo exhibitions, and his work is in numerous private and public collections. Publications of his work include Native Soil, a selection of Spencer's photographs of the American South, published in 1999 by Louisiana State University, and Jack Spencer, Prism Series, 21st Editions, published in 2011. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jack Spencer. What a trip. Um, I don't know if that's supposed to be on yet, Kirk, but that's fine. Uh, it's hot up here, so I'm going to take off all my clothes. <laughs> I know for you guys who, who were here last night, I, I know that I promised you that I would uh, do my presentation. If you came tonight, I would do my presentation in uh, a tiara and a thong. And um, I know that that scared away a lot of people, but a lot of people were expecting it and came for that purpose. And uh, I'm, a, I'm just a liar, OK? Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, and thank the Frist. Uh, the staff has been pretty amazing, uh, pretty incredible, really. Uh, Susan and Mark Scala and Wallace Joyner, in particular, uh, have driven me to drink and heroin use and uh, roaming the streets of uh, Nolensville Road at all hours of the morning. And um, but no, they've they've done uh, they've gone way beyond the call of duty and have done a spectacular job and and it's uh, been much appreciated. Uh, and I, I'm, I couldn't tell you how much I'm thrilled about the show. I, 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 I've never seen my work presented in such a bold way, and it's, it's quite an honor to kind of toil away for 25 years or so and, and then uh, see everything presented in such an elegant, beautiful way, so I'm quite proud of that. Um, <clears throat> I... Uh, um, always kind of start these things by uh, quoting uh, one of my favorite misanthropes, uh, Edward Abbey, who said uh, one time that all artists should have their lips sewn shut uh, <laughs> because they tend to yammer on about really nothing, you know, for days if you let them. And I, I don't really like intellectualizing my work, and I, I, I don't really like explaining it 
really, uh, I like to have the viewer make up their own mind and make up their own stories and their own dialogues to go along with the work. Um, and I've never been a big fan of academia or trying to explain stuff that I don't frankly know what they're talking about. Um, I've read a lot of stuff about, me, about myself that have, leaves me scratching my head. And I can't read Art Forum. I'm sorry. I would probably get more out of a, reading a Chinese phone book than reading Art Forum. But anyway, I started out a long time ago in Kosciuszko, Mississippi. And as a young man in South Louisiana, young kid, child, I used to be fascinated by my grandmother's boxes and boxes and boxes of old photographs, old daguerreotypes and tin types and photographs that were bent and stained and crushed and, and they all had magical stories in them. I didn't have a clue what it, who most of those people were. I'm sure they were distant relatives or friends of my family somewhere in the past. But I didn't know who they were, and so you kind of make up your own little tales that go along with them as a kid. But I was fascinated by those photographs, and I think every artist in the world, I, if it was Michelangelo or Shakespeare or Picasso or Bob Dylan or Ansel Adams or everybody had to at one point start fresh, but they had never picked up a brush or camera or anything at all, and, but their curiosity kind of drew them into it. It's the same thing that happened to me. I was very curious about what happens whenever you make photographs, and, and I majored in art at Louisiana Tech, which is not known as, you know, the greatest art institution in the world, but I learned a lot about how to drink beer and chase women and that kind of stuff, the art, the fine art of that. But I didn't learn much about art, but I used to rent a Minolta camera a, for a dollar a day, and I'd go out and make terrible photographs. But it, it didn't slow me down. I was very curious about it, and I kept doing it, and kept doing it, and fooling around with it, and then I, I made a, a commitment to it. But it was mostly, all came from that curiosity. I think, as artists, we're, we're pretty nosy. We want to see how things work, and you're kind of peering into somebody's existence whenever you make a, a photograph. One of my really good friends years ago was uh, Ruth Bernhardt, the famous photographer who died in 1990, uh, 2006, I believe. At, she was 101 years old. And Ruth was a very good friend, and we spent quite a bit of time together. But I, I, I told her one time that I thought that the reason why she had lived for so long was because of her curiosity. She was fascinated with every little bit of minutia in her life. And um, so my curiosity led me to go off exploring what would happen if I did this and what happened if I did that. So I'm going to go through some slides tonight, um, some images from seven bodies of work. <coughs> and most of this, I, think, I don't think there's any of this work that's in the show. Um, but there are seven bodies of work that are fairly distinctive. And I'd, I've never really liked the idea of just keep doing the same thing over and over and over. I like the idea that there is a pretty broad range in my work that it's, I never stayed locked into any one thing really. There's a thread that runs through all of it. But I'm going to go through each of these bodies of work and um, do my best to give you a cursory explanation of what they're about, and then uh, we'll take a few uh, questions, as long as they're not about gear or um, digital versus film. Questions are completely off, out of bounds. Okay. Uh, is, this, is this thing on? I don't think so.
Why doesn't somebody just do this for I'm kidding with you. I'm kidding with you. Uh, I, I used to, I, I was, the work that I did was like a combination between two photographers that I really liked. I, I always loved Robert Frank, who was a documentary photographer, who just about everything that he did was very literal. It was straightforward. It was uh, exactly what what he's, he saw and what he experienced, even though Steichen once called it every photograph is a lie from start to finish, because you don't know what's going on around that photograph. But anyway, he was quite literal in the way that he made photographs. And I, but I also liked the pictorialist. I liked um, Steichen a lot. I liked the, the pictorialism of that. And I, my idea basically was to combine the two, to uh, document my environment of Mississippi and the South, the Deep South, the way that I was brought up, and try to find some, some way of coming to terms with it. Um, so I set off to make uh, photographs of Mississippi, but I set off to do it in a, in a different kind of way. I didn't want to do straight documentary. And Ansel Adams used to throw rocks at Steichen because he was, was such a pictorialist. Um, but I, I, it, uh, that always astounded me, and I loved Ansel Adams. I thought he was great, but, he, but it astounded me because I, if you've ever seen a photograph of Moonrise over Hernandez, it's one of the ugliest things in, you've ever seen if you look at just the contact print before he got in and started putting his juju on it. Uh, so he was a pictorialist himself. Sorry, Ansel, but you were. Don't try to get out of it. So I'm going to start with some comparison photographs of, of images that um, you'll see just the raw image, and then you'll see the Jack Spencer juju stuff. But it's an interpretation, and I don't, I've never liked the idea that the camera should do all of your work for you. I don't like that at all, not in my own work. Other people, fine. If that's what you want to do, it's OK with me. But I always thought that the original file or the original negative was just a jumping off point. That's where you go and you interpret what it is that you saw or you experienced. And you create some sort of a mood that goes along with that. So in these photographs, you'll see the, the original file. And uh, then you'll see the, the uh, end result. This was uh, taken in 1990 of a little guy in England, Arkansas, named Alex. And this was the original file. And this was the file that I ended up with. And this was one of the photographs that I'm better known, it's called the Baptismal Candidates. And this is the final print. And this is the bridge over Bayou Tesh, which I had no problem cropping out the left side of it and straightening it out a little bit and giving it some mood. These were all film pieces here. But then I moved into the digital world, and it's the same process, really. This one, I, whenever I made it, I kind of had an idea that this was what Bierstadt saw whenever he was out west and didn't have Photoshop. <laughs> but had an imagination. Um, Native Soil was the first uh, body of work that I, that I did. And uh, it's, I've worked on that body of work for over 
I think, for 12 years. Um, and it has a little bit of everything in it. Um, a lot of these were not in the uh, original book of native soil. A lot of these were photographs that had really never been published. They, they were taken in the early 90s. This was my friend Cooter, who I photographed quite a bit. We were great buddies. He was one of the funniest guys I think I'd ever met, and we were wonderful friends. This is the last photograph that I'd made of Cooter. It's called Cooter's Road. I think one of the great, this was the first photograph that I made of native soil. This was taken in. Um, in 1988 in Bobo, Mississippi. I met a lot of wonderful characters doing this body of work. Cooter was one of them. One of the other ones was um, Gussie Morrow, who is probably the, my best known image from all of that body of work, was uh, Gussie's Magnolia, the photograph of her. I don't have that one in this body of work, but it is in the show. But people ask me about Gussie a lot. and. Uh, because she looked like somebody that everybody would love, I, I suppose. But, and she was. She was great. The first time I met her was, I think, in 1995. And I drove by her house, and she was sitting out on the front porch. But she had a, and she had a bandana on, or, and she had a yard that was full of uh, topiary characters, that, like chickens and horses and things like that, that she had carved out of, out of uh, her hedges. And she had a lot of flowers. She loved flowers, and that was why the magnolia was so appropriate for her. But anyway, we, we walked around for a little bit in her yard and talked for a little while. And, and she had this way of mispronouncing words a lot. And she said, uh, Mr. Jack, come over here and see my armadillo plant. Of course, I'm thinking it's a topiary of an armadillo. And I get over there, and it's an amaryllis. And so we go sit down on the porch and we talk for a while. And this was right at the time that Princess Diana was, was killed. So there was news all over the place about the paparazzi, and how bad the paparazzi was. And so after a while, she said, uh, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm a photographer. And she said, uh, hmm, you ain't one of them pizzerazzis, are you? <laughs> She did that all the time, though.
after I finished making uh, native soil, I, I kind of wanted to get away from uh, southern, being a southern photographer, because I'd already been tagged as, as the su southern photographer, and I just, I didn't want to be a southern photographer. I didn't want to be an anything photographer. So I immediately went to Mexico, right after native soil came out. I started photographing down in Mexico, and it, it was a, a book of, the, of mine, that, or a body of work of mine, that, I, that was called Apariciones. And it was basically about the idea that, that figures come in, in and out of your life as a photographer. They show up, they're, they make appearances, and they we dance for a while, and then they disappear. They go their way, so they're apparitions and you kind of call them forth. And this is, uh, this is my favorite body of work. It's a body of work that I've wanted to get published and almost got published a couple of times, but it's never been published. <clears throat> These were photographed pretty much all over Mexico and different places. But it's a very mystical, mysterious land, and it's, you know, it's a place where they have this idea that on a certain day of the year that people come back from the dead and they take them tequila and food and drink and they dance with them for a day and then they go away. So it was a perfect place for a mysterious body of work. And it's quite mysterious down there. This is kind of what I was talking about, that, and that sometimes these people show up and they're, they just kind of like leave you with a poem. And this woman showed up with her broken umbrella, her two kids in this cart in the middle of nowhere in this little town called Sieta Realis, out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, made one of my favorite photographs that's in the show upstairs called The Woman with the Broken Umbrella. Sorry, I'm going a little bit fast for these, uh, but I want to get through and there's, I think, 170, so we're going to zip through those and then I'm going to go drink heavily. <laughs> Keep your questions to a minimum, please. That's the woman with the broken umbrella. I didn't know it was in there. And these were all done, the, all, the entire body of work for apparitions were all glazed with an oleopasto glaze, which is a, a pigment and um, oil paint that gave them a richness that they wouldn't normally have. But all of the, the entire body of work was done in the same way. Um, flower series is a series that's been a little bit of, of there's been a little bone of contention with that because there's some of my galleries that are more sophisticated didn't really want anything to do with they thought it was beneath me to make pictures of flowers 
But I, I never ask permission from a gallery person to what I should do or what I shouldn't do. And, and I, this came at a time whenever I was kind of on a high horse and I, I needed a little correction. And whenever I need some correction, I, I always found out the best thing to do is simplify, to go back to basics, go back to just pure uh, simplicity. And, and I walked out of my house one day and I looked down and there was this, these peonies that were popping up out of the ground and it was cold, and, but they were making their way through the hard ground and, and they came up and they expressed themselves in, in the most miraculous way. And I don't know, people think that I'm insane, but I, have you ever sat down and just looked at how incredible a flower is? And so I did this series um, on flowers for a short time, still occasionally photograph a flower, but I, I, I really liked this series. And a lot of my galleries didn't want anything to do with them. Uh, and a few galleries, of course, did quite well with them. So uh, the irony of that is, is that one day in my studio, I got a phone call and <clears throat> it was from um, this girl who said she was in Beverly Hills, California, and she uh, worked for the Lucy Foundation, which is supposedly like the Academy Awards of Photography. And she said that she called to announce to me that I had won the International Photographer of the Year Award. I was like, well, that's pretty cool. And she said, well, you won it for the nature category. I said, but I'm not a nature photographer. I'm, she said, well, you won for your flower series. And I said, but I'm not a nature photographer. She said, well, you won the award anyway. We're giving it out in New York next month. So I said, great. So they, they sent me a plaque. And for a while, we had it turned upside down in my studio. So I, we thought that was quite ironic that some people hated them. And, I was the International Photographer of the Year. Um, the Lost Boys series started, uh, you know, I, I can't remember exactly how many years ago that was, but, I, but I'd been studying the Lost Boys, uh, the story of the Lost Boys for many years. Um, and it's one of the most tragic stories in history. It's a horrible story. And, um, I had heard... Uh, on the news or somewhere that there, there were 350 lost boys being um, immigrated to, the, well there was I think 2200 lost boys being immigrated to the United States and 350 of them were coming to Nashville. And it, I was very interested in that and I tried to find out who knew where I could find some of these guys because I was interested in, in documenting them. and. and and taking their pictures and and becoming involved with them in some way, no, in no way of making money off of them at all. I'd never made anything. But anyway, I um, a, a friend of mine, Bob Delavante's brother Mike 
Delavante happened to be working with Catholic Charities organization and had uh, helped to bring them over. And uh, so he introduced me to Gabriel Wall, who's Gabriel is still one of my dear best friends. And so Gabriel kind of hooked me up with some of the other Lost Boys, and we became very good friends. I just fell in love with these guys. They had such a rich spirit, and they were just great guys. And so I started making a portrait series of them. And I probably photographed, I think, 25 or 30 of them. And uh, Pell Guy, who was uh, just a wonderful young man, um, was murdered, was killed. Uh, in the craziest way that you can imagine. It's, he certainly didn't deserve it. But he, he died and there was, uh, there was no money to bury Pell. And so Gabriel and the Doc and a, a lot of the Lost Boys came to me to see if I could help them to bury Pell because the funeral home said that they were just going to put him on ice until we could come up with the money. So I called some of my friends, and my friends and I got together and came up with the money to bury Pell. But at that point, we realized that there was nobody helping these guys, really. They were kind of dangling out there. They, they were immigrated to the United States, and they were left to just kind of, they, they were taught how to go grocery shopping and how to catch a bus and how to work a microwave when most of them had never even worn shoes before. Um, and then they were left to fend for themselves after two months of training in the most sophisticated culture on earth and so they they were just kind of dangling out there so we started a foundation for them and um, and it, even though I, I don't have much to do with the foundation anymore I was the founder and and I still have a lot to do with the boys I keep good contact with them so here are some of their portraits and this is probably the only body of work that I've ever done that's that's very literal, that's straightforward, uh, no ma manipulation whatsoever. And this man here, a uh, young man, is David was, he was stabbed at the same time as Pell was stabbed. And he was in the hospital for five weeks, but he survived. This was Pell's younger brother. And this is Pell. He was a wonderful young man. Spoke three languages. Very bright. And it's Pell again. And this is uh, Samuel Gene, the smiling machine, we called him. Um, the Gestures and Portrait series was a series that I worked on for a few years. Uh, mostly it came from my interest in painting and Degas and movements and compositional movements and, um, and color. And, and whenever I started making digital pictures, I was able to finally make color images. And I always liked color, but I did, never had the patience to work in the dark room with color. So whenever I started making digital prints, all of a sudden I was in uh, some form of heaven. So I had a really good time at color compositions and, and, uh, and movements and dance and energy um, and gestures.
Um, this land is a body of work that was started in the year 2003, um, although there are some images that are American landscapes that kind of predate that, but the main problem, the main thing that really kind of fired me into doing it and, and um, getting started with it was um, the lead up to the war in Iraq, which bothered me a lot. I, I didn't, I thought it was pretty silly. I thought it was just insane, to be honest with you. I thought it was way premature, and I, I was pretty angry at the United States, and I, I had a show that I was gonna do in, in Sun Valley, Idaho, at Gail Severn Gallery, so I decided to uh, drive out to Sun Valley and do a portrait, start making a portrait series of of America, so I took off driving and ended up doing a 9,000 mile driving trip, a gigantic circle around America, uh, it was, which was wonderful to tell you the truth, but it was, I was gone for six weeks and um, didn't want to come home really. But I started off with this idea of America as being one thing, and, it, and of course it was that in a lot of ways, that there was this hyper patriotism with people who had painted their cars and their children even sometimes red white and blue and their barns and their houses and there was flags that were everywhere the, the patriotism was ubiquitous and it was it was it was making me even more ill that everybody bought into this idea that somehow going and killing somebody else would solve their problem uh, but anyway as, as i went on through that i i started seeing that that there was this dichotomy that there was this this range of of America that it's sure it does have some bones rattling around in its closet, but it, at the same time it's an absolutely beautiful, bold and stunning country. And so it kind of morphed into that. It started off with pictures that we we tore and we we tore the edges and we bent them and we walked on them and we stained them and we did all kinds of things and and. Um, but eventually we started making pictures that were actually kind of pretty, that were actually kind of beautiful. So it, it went through this full range of uh, imagery. This is actually in Nashville, that's out at Percy Warner Park. These are Montana, so there's a lot of horses. The horses are Pretty American. These are antelope in Montana. New York City. The barn in Indiana. My Rothko barn. This is an experiment that I'd had for a while that I really liked of overexposing images. Um, fortunately, I was the only one that liked them. Uh, I never liked the idea that you had to set up a camera and it tells you what the correct exposure was. And I always tried to give my camera a headache. And a lot of times it worked. I mean, it, um, Damn machines. These clouds were up in South Dakota, and they were uh, South Dakota has the most amazing skies and cloud formations I've ever seen. I don't know if it's because of the air currents coming off of the Rockies or <clears throat> or what it was, but I followed these clouds around for a long time. This was outside of Badlands, and. Uh, I couldn't find anything to reference to put into the picture with them. Uh, finally, I came up to that dead tree there, and it, it seemed to work. This is out at Percy Warner Park again. I do photograph around Nashville occasionally. This is on Cumberland Island. Cumberland Island. This is out in Williamson County. There's an image that's in the show that's similar to this called Soybeans. 
This is in Death Valley. This is in Zebulon, Georgia. We have some distinguished guests from there tonight. This is Percy Warner Park again. Probably the darkest picture ever made of um, Mount Rushmore. You won't see that on any postcards from there anytime soon. This is right outside of Monument Valley. A guy decided to put up his own uh, Monument Valley and I mean, uh, Mount Rushmore, this was his interpretation of it, I suppose. But this Greenwood, Mississippi from the Alluvian Hotel. This is a rattlesnake church. This is on the first trip. This was up about a few miles from the Canadian border in northern Montana, and I photographed this. I, I think it was actually a school, but I started calling it a church, and that just stuck. But I went up to photograph on the side of this building, on the other side, and I I'd photographed it with a four by five Polaroid, and I decided to go kind of try to check inside of it because it was all boarded up except for the other side. And I went around to the other side, and I kind of hoisted myself up on the window, and, and I heard this buzzing sound, and I didn't know what it was. And I looked down, and there was a rattlesnake right next to my short pants. And he was buzzing away, and he was, was freaking me out, basically, <laughs> and he started backing away, and I started backing away, and I took off running and screaming, <laughs> screaming like a little girl, by the way. Uh, but since then, I've called it uh, Rattlesnake Church. Don't care if it's a church or a school. There was a rattlesnake there. <laughs> in Las Vegas, New Mexico. That's Percy Warner Park again. The mythology series is the last series that I'm going to show here, and the mythology series is basically a series that started with a, a woman who had called, or a model who had sent me an email and wanted me to photograph her. Um, she, she was a fan of my work and asked me if, if I would, she was going to be in Nashville if I'd be interested in making her photograph, and I basically said, well, I, I think I'm retired. I, I don't know where my camera is, I, and I haven't shot anything in a year and a half, and but thanks for getting in touch with me. So she uh, asked if she could come by to meet me, and so she did, and I um, said, sure, come on by. And she came by when she was in town, and we talked for a while, and she said, do you, know, do you make some photographs, or would you like to make some photographs? And I said, well, yeah, we'll try something. So we made a few images and shot for about a half an hour, and I just said, you know what, I just don't, I'm just not interested, I don't really have it. So she said, well, that's cool. And so we sat around and talked for a little while, and she said, well, let's just do something crazy. We'd had a few beers by then, so I said, sure, let's do that. So I had some body paint, and I said, well, let's give this a try. So I started painting her body, and I got to, it's the, actually the first photograph, and it's one of the best, it's the one that's on the cover of Nashville Arts Magazine. Um, it's called Nettie, and it's, uh, and so I looked at it and thought, well, this is good. This is, I can do something with this. And so it started the entire series. So it kind of brought me out of a funk and a phase. So I went about making these images. None of these images, I don't think any of these images are in the show upstairs, in the mythology's room. 
but I know that this one was shot after the choices were made for the show, and Mark really wanted this one in the show, but it was too late. And that's it. Thank you. Appreciate it. A uh, few questions. Remember the uh, rules, everybody? Okay. <laughs> I don't want Susan to have to hurt you. And we've got Jerry Atnip right here who will take you apart. Uh, any questions? First of all, maybe there aren't any questions. Okay. Say it again. L lots. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, to elaborate further, I just I think artists should be always something that you do because it can be done. Um, I don't think it should be done as a profession uh, or as a way to make money. And whenever you get into Dwayne Michaels, one time said, "Whenever art and commerce mix, it's pretty much the end of it. It's the end of art." Uh, so you do it for the purposes of you love art, and that's why you do it. Um, you, you love the creative process, and you follow that. As long as you follow that, you hopefully you'll be successful in, all, in every way. Um, one follows the other. Any other questions? Yes. Well, obviously, you can't do it alone. So it's a collaboration right up, right from the get-go. But I, I, my idea really for models and uh, photographing models and subjects, <clears throat> um, unless it's something literal like the Lost Boys or something like that, is not to, not to overly direct. But I, 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 li I enjoy the, I enjoy making photographs with people who are who are creative themselves. And they have no problem with, uh, with acting. And they're not camera aware. They, 
a lot of people are terrified of the camera, and the camera picks that up. Uh, but I, what I like to do as far as directing models is I, I like to, I mean, the mythology series, I painted their bodies and painted their faces, and, and so it was, it was, for me, it was like a mixture of photography and painting. I started off as a painter, so you create something from, out of whole cloth from the get-go. You're, you're creating a mythical subject that didn't exist before and doesn't exist now. Uh, so that part of it, it was all me. I was, I was making a painting and then combining it with photography. So, uh, <clears throat> but as far as telling them what to do and directing them, I, I pretty much always um, have my subjects act and then I react to how they act. Um, and, I, and it's one of the things with movements and dances and the Degas look on some of the images that I got with the movements and the blurs. <clears throat> just came from me reacting to what they were doing. So it's, it's a matter of paying attention and intending what you're getting, but allowing them to, to do what it is they do and be themselves and just try to capture the essence of that. Anybody else? Yes? No, I, I don't. I used to be. I, I'll say that. Whenever I first started off, I was intimidated by the, and I know a lot of students are. They're terrified of going up and asking somebody if they can make their photograph. But I, I think what you finally realize is that most people are actually kind of flattered by that. They're honored by that. You know, some people are say definitely not, and you have to honor that. You have to say. Thank you very much. And I believe me, I have lost some great photographs from people who said I would rather not. And I always honor that, pay attention to it. But, you know, it's like Gussie. You know, Gussie was somebody who was just wonderful from the get go. And me and Cooter hit it off right away. And, and a lot of the people that I photographed, we, we had some kind of a bond or some kind of a rapport that, that really just kind of led us to the next step and then the next step, and then the next step, and the next thing you know, we're old buddies. So, but I think that I understand your question because it used to scare the bejesus out of me to go up and ask somebody if I could photograph them. Yes? No. No, I mean, I, I think, you know, one of the great things about uh, digital photography is that pixels are free. You know, and you can experiment a lot, all you want to, and a lot of times I just go out and I start shooting and I, I will just take my aperture ring and, or my shutter speed and just start throwing everything out of whack and, and, and waiting for a happy accident to happen which a lot of people refuse to do with digital cameras. They want them to work perfectly uh, all the time. And so they're constantly looking at that little thing on the back and seeing if it works fine. You know, I'm not. I'm just kind of pushing things around and hoping to screw up my camera so bad that it, that it gets a headache. So uh, it's, it's not really that complicated if you're making some photographs and you see that they're getting kind of a watercolory look or they're overexposed uh, in such a way that they're starting to look interesting. I just kind of keep shooting at that setting and don't pay any attention to it. Yes? Well, that's a pretty good question, I suppose. I mean, the, the obvious thing is to, to be flip about it and say, well, make, you know, be born rich and make a million dollars or something like that. But uh, it's, a, it's a complicated uh, life to be an artist. It's, it's not an easy thing. Um, there's very few of us who actually can make a living at it. I feel very honored by the fact that I can. I mean, it's, 
It's a, but it's still a tough way to go. And you take your lumps and you, I think the main thing that I learned was to have some dedication to, I think that the main thing that I ever learned was that you have to be dedicated to it. You have to commit to it. You have to make a concrete decision that this is what you're going to do and you go about doing it. And then whenever I first started photographing native soil, I mean, I was, I was very poor. I, I mean, I didn't have any money at all, and I, and I used to paint signs for a living. And I'd paint signs for car dealerships. I'd, I'd paint banners for them. I'd do truck lettering for them. I'd do hand-painted pinstripes. And, and I used to go down to Mississippi to photograph down there, and I worked for a guy named Buddy Jones at Buddy Jones Ford in Greenwood, Mississippi. And Buddy was, was on to what I was doing, he, and he was very supportive of that. And so every time I would show up there, he would give me three or four days of work to, to do and out in the hot sun in Mississippi, and, and I would go out and paint signs uh, for three or four days to make enough money to pay for my trip to go, allow me to go shoot for a couple of weeks. And then I would go shoot for a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm talking about from 5 o'clock in the morning until 9 o'clock at night, endlessly driving around. Uh, it was like a fishing expedition or hunting expedition or whatever. But I would spend all of that money, and I would usually end up back in Nashville flat broke. Usually come in on driving in on fumes, and I would I would take my camera out to a pawn shop out on Murfreesboro Road, and the guy would see me coming. He he knew the routine. And he would give me $500 for my camera so that I could go buy paper to print the stuff that I just shot. And then I would sell a few prints, and then I would go get my camera out of Hawk, and I would go through the same process again. And I did that for years. And it's what I had to do. And I would, I would imagine that the, if there's one lesson that I learned and one thing that, that I gleaned from all of this was that if you really have a passion for something, something you really believe in, something you really want to do, find a way to go do it. There is a way it's possible to do it. Anybody? Yes? Jerry? I think the series tells, I think it tells you. I, I know photographing native soil at the end of that, I would go back to Mississippi and I'd find nothing. Uh, all of the holes were dried up. There was nothing there. Um, same thing happened in Mexico. The last trip I went to Mexico, I didn't shoot anything. Uh, and it, it, I think that it just kind of goes away and you, you don't see the same way that you did. And it's, it's like it's some internal mechanism that goes off that says, well, that's done, move on. And it's a good thing to move on. It's a great thing to move on. Find something else. Yes? So when you're photographing, I know, at least in some of the images, you're very deliberate with what you're seeing. When, when do you, are you thinking about putting your juju on it while you're shooting it, or do you do it on the back end? I know you talked about some of the images you shot and you tore them off, and different processes to them, so. Uh. No, I, th I think the whole process, there's one element that plays into all of it, and that's, in, you know, is this interesting? Uh, is this something that interests me? Is this, am I fascinated by this thing? It's like the Ruth Bernhardt effect. I mean, the photo I photographed Ruth years ago with this tiny little shell in her, her hand that's just the most fascinating thing in the world. But something that interests you and if it interests you while you're making it more than likely it's going to interest you while you're you're building it and working on it so i don't really ever think about what the final outcome could be ever really i just want to know if it's an interesting thing that kind of gets my juices flowing at the moment of shooting yes more so. 
simple things. Yes. No, I've, 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 played, I've got this thing inside of me that's pretty brutal sometimes. It's self-correcting, but it's, um, I, you know, whatever you make photographs for a while or you start having shows and people pat you on the back and they hoist you up and, and, and parade you through the village, you know that sooner or later they're going to take you down a dark alley and beat the shit out of you. <laughs> you know, so... So you have to, you have to, I mean, there's plenty of ways to get self-corrected. Um, and, but my ways, I mean, I think it's a good idea just to, even in life is whenever things are not going very well, simplify. It's just a good rule of thumb across the board. I don't care if you're a plumber or a housewife or what it is you do, it's simplify, always simplify. And, and whenever you do that, things have a way of falling into place. And going to the flowers thing was like the best therapy I could possibly have had. It was a wonderful thing of seeing this magical thing that happens all around us. It happens everywhere that people walk right past this incredible thing that's happening. So, yes? I do, you know, I don't really know. I, I don't know. I, I, you know, successful, I, I don't know. I mean, it's been a fairly steady thing um, over the years. I, I don't really know. I mean, I, I, native soil, of course, whenever that came out, I was kind of a fresh face, believe it or not. Um, and I got a lot of attention out of that. So, but I suppose that was that had some success and and some hoisting up on broad shoulders and parading through the village and getting the shit beat out of you. But uh, as far as any one body of work that sold well or made me money, I don't know. I really don't. I know that that some works are more rewarding than others, but that, that's throughout all the bodies of work. There's pieces in there that, that are very memorable, and that a lot of times you wish you could go back and do the whole thing all over again the same exact way. Yes? Are you in a process of going through another series? Well, I'm, I'm thinking of getting into the movie business. <laughs> I want I want to play a romantic lead. At some point. <laughs> so, so you don't have any like concepts going in your well, I, I do, but it's it really is about movies, about making uh, a documentary film, and I'm I'm working kind of in that direction. What I've always wanted to do is direct. Uh, <laughs> no, but I, I am. Uh, but I want to do it in the same way that I make photographs. So, but th that's a whole other thing to get into, and it's uh, and it's uh, almost bad luck to be talking about it right now. So you're pretty much finished your Maybe I might shoot stills on the movie. Yeah, uh, I don't. Uh, I, I don't ever say that I'm done with anything. Uh, I, you, you never know. So, okay, one or two more, and that's. So it's Miller time. Uh, any more? Yes? I don't know. Uh, one more? Is that it? Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoy the show, too.